Well, let's just acknowledge the weirdness of this up front. Uh, this feels very strange for me to be preaching in the privacy of my home, uh, and it maybe feels strange for you to be listening to a sermon in the privacy of your home, or maybe you do it all the time, I don't know. Uh, but this is a strange situation, but these are the circumstances that God has brought us into. And so we want to trust Him in the midst of these circumstances, uh, this trial that He's brought us into as a church and as a community and as a country even. And so we want to count on Him for the good things that He is doing through all of this. I, I want to uh, remind you that uh, you, know, you should have received an email earlier this week that had the sermon outline, and it has blanks on it. If you want to fill those out, if that helps you follow along, that's... Uh, uh, that's there for you. You could print it out or bring it up on your computer. Or uh, if you don't care to fill in those blanks and you'd like a guide still on the page where you're watching this video or where you might have downloaded it, you can also download a PDF copy of the sermon outline all filled in with all the blanks filled in. And that can be a helpful guide uh, as we work through uh, this message and this passage uh, here. So as we begin, if you would, where you are in your homes or wherever you're watching or listening from, uh, take a moment and pray uh, with me. Father, we give you thanks for the circumstances that we're in. We are to be thankful in all circumstances, and, and sometimes that's harder than other times. We thank you for this opportunity that we have to open your word together. It is not as we would prefer it, that we could be together in one place, uh, seeing each other face to face, but nevertheless, your word still has power, and we want to receive good, we want to receive grace from your word. We pray that your word would, uh, that you would speak through your word, and that you would change us by it. Help us to listen well, help us to respond with faith and obedience uh, as we listen to your word. Build our faith, grant us the endurance that we need to press on through this trial and help us to be wise and loving uh, as we uh, seek to live in this world that is broken and that is experiencing uh, a very painful reality right at the moment. Uh, give us grace for this season, however long it should last. We pray that you would protect us. I pray for my brothers and sisters at home that you would pr protect them from injury, from illness, from harm. Uh, keep them safe. Uh, but also build their faith, strengthen them for uh, the challenges that are ahead, and preserve them from harm. Thank you, Father, that you're with us through this, that you're walking with us through this difficulty, and that you will provide what is needed. Uh, we ask for your help as we open your word together. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we enter into the second half of James chapter 2, we are entering into a passage that has been and remains this, at the center of controversy. My understanding of this passage puts me square in the middle of it, and as it turns out, the controversy has multiple angles. My understanding of this passage puts me at odds with two other prominent ways of reading this passage, and in some ways, I find myself standing between those who we might can truly consider enemies of the gospel and others who are engaging in friendly fire. It's important to know which is which. On the one hand, this passage fueled much of the debate between the Roman Catholic Church and the Reformers at the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. The doctrine of justification was at the heart of the debates that drove that major controversy in the 1500s and beyond. Still today, this is perhaps the greatest divide between Catholics and Protestants. James says that people are justified by works. Paul says that people are justified by faith. Catholics want to combine those statements in a certain way so that they teach that people are justified by faith plus works in the sense that works are viewed as earning a righteous status before God. Catholics view works as meritorious. Obedience has purchasing power to acquire righteousness from God. Protestants, on the other hand, work to reconcile Paul's teaching and James's teaching on the topic of justification differently. We Protestants recognize no meritorious value in our works. Justification, the verdict of righteous, 
that God pronounces over the lives of his people cannot be earned. It is a gift of his grace. Catholics at this point are considered enemies of the gospel. They have nullified God's grace by teaching that people can earn righteousness from God. But on the other side of the field, there are those who focus on a slightly different issue from this passage. Some Protestants believe that James is not talking about salvation from judgment, salvation from hell in the book of James. So that when James speaks of dead faith that cannot save, he is not talking about eternal salvation. He is talking about salvation from physical death or salvation from being ineffective in your walk with the Lord. Dead faith for these folks is still true faith. People who claim to believe in Jesus are truly saved from hell, have eternal life, and will never perish if they're sincere in their faith. But if their faith is dead, it doesn't produce any good in this life, and they will miss out on heavenly rewards. The name that this movement has given itself is Free Grace Theology, a name which frustrates me in many ways, not least of which is that I believe they have misunderstood both freedom and grace from the scriptures. Nevertheless, most of these folks are not enemies of the gospel outright. Rather, they are engaging in friendly fire. But, as those of you with a military background will quickly recognize, friendly fire can still be, and often is, fatal. So I take these issues very seriously. Today, I'm not going to seek to address all of the debated issues in this passage. I see my responsibility as primarily showing you what I see in the text. But if you listen carefully, you will hear my engagement with these different perspectives. We need to be clear on these issues. We need to be clear about justification. We need to be clear about the nature of faith. We need to be clear on the place of works in relationship to justification and salvation. Many folks see the real controversy here as between James and Paul. As will become clear, I don't think that's right at all. And at the end of our time, we'll seek to connect James and Paul together on this issue. But let's go ahead and dive into the passage. But the controversy aspects of this passage have led me to be controversial, even in my outline. The word verses appears several times in the structure of this message, as in, Faith versus works, Paul versus James, or dead faith versus living faith. We'll begin by considering saying faith, with a Y, versus saving faith, with a V, in verses 14 to 16. James 2, 14 to 16. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. James moves from his comments on judgment in verse 13 into raising an important rhetorical question. What good is it? What's the benefit? And the answer that he's expecting us to recognize is that there's no benefit, no good, no benefit whatsoever for a person who says he has faith, who claims to know and trust Jesus, but does not have works. The person James is describing is a person who says he has faith. That's a present tense verb in Greek. James is implying that this person is always going around claiming his faith, but this constant saying has no external evidence to support the claim. Claiming to have faith while actually having no works is no good, does no good to oneself or anybody else. Flowing right out of verse 13, I'm convinced that James must mean particularly, what good will it do on judgment day? But if it won't do any good on judgment day, then it won't do any good before then either. His final rhetorical question in verse 14 pounds the significance home. This claimed faith cannot save. And again, I'm convinced he means that this claimed faith that doesn't have works cannot save from God's judgment. 
Then in verses 15 to 16, James provides an illustration, a comparison of sorts, to show what he means. He closes the illustration with the same question that opened verse 14. What good is it? What benefit is there? What's the benefit? And again, the answer that he's expecting us to recognize is that there's no benefit. No benefit whatsoever when a person claiming to be a believer in Jesus, claiming to be in the family of God, simply speaks well wishes to a sibling with physical needs while not physically meeting those needs. The wording of the well wishes is interesting. The ESV expresses the words in the passive voice. Go in peace. Be warmed and filled. Viewed this way, the person is saying two things. First, he is dismissing the person. Go away. Depart in peace. A typically Jewish way of saying, may the Lord grant you wholeness. Then the other commands are in the passive voice. Be warmed by God. Be filled by God. This is the equivalent of seeing someone who has no food, no shelter, no protection, not even the basic protection of clothing, and saying, gosh, I'll pray for you, but not offering the person a meal or a coat or a blanket. The person is saying, I'll pray for you. I, I, we can trust God to meet your needs, but I'm not going to. James's illustration is more than a simple analogy, however. His illustration is a very real way that claiming to believe in Jesus but not having works might look. It seems so spiritual. We want to trust God to meet their needs. But isn't it normal, regular, almost always, that God uses us to meet each other's needs? What will happen on Judgment Day to those who claim to follow Jesus and yet regularly refused to meet the needs of other followers of Jesus? James already said that the judgment will be without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Jesus painted this picture quite vividly in one of his parables. Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46, the parable of the separation of sheep from goats. Verse 31 sets the stage. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. When Jesus returns, He will be coming to judge. Verse 32 provides the analogy that the parable is based on. Before Him will be gathered all the nations, and He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Note the word as. Jesus is comparing what will happen in judgment as, in some ways, similar to what a shepherd does with sheep and goats. The separation will be on an individual basis. Each sheep and each goat represent individuals from all the nations, Jews and Gentiles alike. James is focusing on the goats. Goats are those who claim to be followers of Jesus, claim to have faith, but do not meet the needs of other followers of Jesus. Goats do not truly have faith, even though they claim to. James asks, is it possible for that claim of faith to save them from a merciless judgment? No, it is not possible for a mere profession of faith to save them. Jesus described the situation vividly. To the goats in the parable, the shepherd king says, Matthew 25, 41, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Then he explains why they are being condemned by describing the deeds they lacked, the works that they did not have. And the goats will protest. Verse 44, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? The goats are saying, when did we have an opportunity to do these works that would have served you? Notice that they call him Lord. With their words, with their mouths, they are claiming allegiance to their king, to the king. 
They are claiming to trust him as Lord. The shepherd king's response is heart-wrenching. Verse 45, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these. And I think at this point we should imagine the shepherd king gesturing over to the sheep. You did not do it to me. Jesus then brings the conclusion home in verse 46. And these goats will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. What's the difference between a sheep and a goat? Physically, the kind of goats that are referred to here look very similar to sheep. In a herd of thousands of animals... A shepherd would be hard-pressed to look out over the mass of them and tell the difference between sheep and goats with just a glance. But what does the figure of speech refer to in reality? Sheep and goats both look alike in the sense they both call Jesus Lord. They both verbally claim faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord. They come to church regularly. They're all involved in Bible studies and Sunday school classes. Sheep and goats are very hard to tell apart. But the key difference between the two, the difference that may fool others, but never fools the shepherd king, is that sheep provide the needs of other sheep. They care for each other with works, with deeds. Their claim of faith is completed, expressed in good works that benefit other sheep. Goats merely talk the talk. When the opportunity to meet someone's needs comes before their face, they may offer to pray for the needy person, but they will not do anything that practically addresses the need. Now, I want to be careful here. God does not expect each one of us to meet every single need that comes to our attention. But when a need does come to our attention... Each one of us should carefully, prayerfully examine the resources that God has provided to determine whether we might be able to meet the need ourselves. Or, if we don't think we can meet the need ourselves, we ought to offer to walk with them, to actually help them find the provision they need. In verses 18 and 19, we're going to see the controversy between Faith or works versus faith and works. Look at verses 18 and 19. But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. James introduces an imaginary opponent probably reflecting a belief that he's heard some folks in the churches he's addressing have come to believe. James just said in verse 17, which we'll come back to later, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. James knows of some who would disagree with that statement. Their disagreement goes like this. Come on, James. One person may have faith, maybe even expressed simply in a monotheistic creed, saying and believing the one God will meet the needs of the physically needy sibling. And another person may have works expressed by actually meeting the physical need of the needy sibling. Faith and works are two separate things, both good and important, but they don't have to be present in the same person at the same time. This, I think, is a fair way to describe what this opponent means by his claim to faith. Maybe he's heard Paul's teaching on spiritual gifts, which years later would be written down to the church in Corinth, what we know of as 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul mentions a spiritual gift of faith. And so James's opponent seems to believe that one person might have that gift, while a different person in the church might have a gift of service, a separate spiritual gift, which Peter mentions. It could also be that their thinking, again from Paul's teaching, isn't faith alone sufficient to save me from judgment? James, you seem to be saying that faith alone isn't enough to save me from judgment. 
They seem to think that justification could be either by faith or by works alone. Either by faith alone or by works alone. How does James reply? Faith is invisible, but faith and works are indivisible. You cannot separate them. And yet, faith must be shown. It must become visible. Can you show me your faith without works? Sure, you can recite the monotheistic creed, but I can show you my faith by my works. That's the rest of verse 18 and the beginning of verse 19. The second half of verse 19 lays down James's condemnation of the opponent. Even demons believe the truth of the monotheistic creed, and they actually show their faith by their works. They shudder. Demons have a saying faith. They can recite all the truths about the attributes of God, the work of God in the gospel, and even the future final victory of God over their own evil. And you've got to appreciate James's sarcasm. He says that the demons' saying faith, their claimed faith, is better than these people who claim to believe in Jesus but have no works at all. Because the demons respond with terrified shuddering. But this profession of mental agreement with the truth about God is not saving faith. Just as the demons cannot be saved from eternal judgment, neither can people whose faith goes no further than mental agreement with truths about God be saved. People who claim to have faith in Jesus but have no works will join the demons after Judgment Day in hell, the place prepared for the devil and his angels, as Jesus said. In verse 20, we get another transitional-type statement that introduces the examples of Abraham and Rahab. We'll come back to verse 20, but notice that James is continuing the imaginary dialogue with his opponent, and he refers to him as foolish, a term that more literally means empty, which is a clever turn of phrase. His opponent believes that it's just fine to have faith with no works, or said differently, his opponent's faith is empty, and so he himself is empty. James is going to prove to him from the Old Testament that faith without works does no good, is dead, is useless. And to do so, he's going to talk about justification. Justification and the faith and works of Abraham and Rahab, verses 21 to 25. We'll start with Abraham, verses 21 to 24. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. So here's the point that James is making. Faith and works work together. Abraham showed his faith, was justified by his work of offering Isaac on the altar. Righteousness is counted by faith. That's Genesis 15, 6. And faith is shown by works. That's Genesis 22, 12. These are the verses that, have to, that we have to square with Paul's teaching, which we'll come back to. But before we do that, let me just mention that even Paul can use the term justify with slightly different meanings. I believe the simplest way to recognize how James and Paul fit together on this issue is to pay attention to how they use the words justify and justification. In Romans 3.4, Paul uses the term justify to mean shown to be righteous. He's quoting Psalm 51.4 and speaking about God. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar, as it is written, that you, God, may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. There, Paul uses this Greek word to mean vindicated or shown to be righteous. God is shown to be righteous by what he has said. I think James is using the word that way in this passage. 
So in verse 21, when he raises the question, was not Abraham our father justified by works? He means, was not Abraham our father shown to be righteous? Didn't Abraham show his righteousness by his work of offering Isaac on the altar? Now we've got to pay close attention to what James is doing here. James actually speaks of two justifications in verses 21 and 23. Justification by works happened when he offered Isaac. That was in Genesis 22. But in verse 23, James quotes Genesis 15, 6. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Paul quotes that same verse, Genesis 15, 6, twice. In both Romans 4 and Galatians 3, and he equates the phrase, he defines the phrase, counted righteous, as being justified. So, James is acknowledging that Abraham was justified by faith in Genesis 15, 6. But then Abraham was justified by works in Genesis 22. The question we have to answer is, what's the relationship between justification by faith and justification by works? But first, let's drill down into how, or in what sense, Abraham was justified by works in Genesis 22, when he offered Isaac. How did that act show Abraham's righteousness? You remember the story, right? Genesis 22, 1 tells us that God tested Abraham. That is to say, he put Abraham through a trial, a test. That's a very relevant situation for James. God commanded Abraham to sacrifice Isaac on an altar. But I'm sure you remember that Isaac is the son of the promise. He's the promised son to Abraham and Sarah. That seems to threaten the fulfillment of God's promises to Abraham and to Isaac. If Isaac dies, how will God fulfill his promises to Abraham to multiply his descendants through Abraham and Sarah's offspring? Remarkably, the Genesis narrative doesn't tell us anything about Abraham protesting, arguing, or questioning God about this. Instead, the narrative simply describes how Abraham got busy obeying. They traveled to the mountain where God commanded him to do the deed, Abraham leading Isaac along with at least one servant accompanying them, carrying the material to offer a sacrifice. The only thing missing was the lamb a detail which young Isaac noticed along the way and asked his father about. Abraham's response reveals something of a remarkable faith. Genesis 22.8 God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. What is Abraham believing at this point? He's not yet anticipating a substitute. Instead, Abraham's son will become the lamb. Because God has commanded Abraham to offer Isaac as a burnt offering, Abraham knows that Isaac is to be the burnt offering, the lamb for the burnt offering, but he can't bring himself to tell Isaac that. Once they reach the appointed mountain, Abraham and Isaac leave the servant behind. Abraham builds the altar with wood ready to be set on fire, binds Isaac with ropes, lays his son down on the altar, raises the knife to slit the young lad's neck, and the angel of Yahweh yells at Abraham to stop him. It's got to be one of the most dramatic moments in all of Scripture. The angel stops the sacrifice and comments on Abraham's righteousness. In Genesis 22, 12, the angel says to Abraham, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for... Now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. It is this moment that I believe James specifically refers to when he says, Abraham was justified by works. He showed his righteousness so that the angel could see it. The angel could say, now I know that you fear God. Your obedience to God's command to sacrifice Isaac shows that you fear God, shows the evidence that you've been counted righteous. 
Now, by itself, what happens there in Genesis 22 does not fit in James's argument with his opponent. But when he connects what happens in Genesis 22 with what God said in Genesis 15, we can see how the showing of righteousness, the demonstration of righteousness in obedience to God is also the showing of faith. Go back to James 2. In James 2, 22 and 23, we read, You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works, and the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. At this point, James is now done with his imaginary opponent. The you see in verse 22 is plural in Greek. He's now returning to address the audience of the letter directly. James says that what happens in Genesis 22 fulfilled what God said in Genesis 15, 6. Now, typically, when we see the word fulfilled in connection with a Bible verse, we think of prophecy and fulfillment, or more precisely, prediction and fulfillment. We think that an Old Testament verse might predict that something is going to happen, and then the fulfillment is when that predicted event actually happens. That's not what's going on here. Genesis 15, 6 is not a prediction or a prophecy. It is the pronouncement of God's verdict over Abraham's life. God has counted him righteous, justified him by his faith. Abraham believed the promises of God trusted God himself, and God immediately pronounced the verdict of righteous over his life. Furthermore, he was called a friend of God. Abraham's faith was not a simple once-in-a-lifetime act. His faith characterized a new relationship with God. Trusting this God implied a relationship, a friendship even. James will come back to this concept in chapter 4 where he will warn us about being friends with the world. To anticipate his argument a bit, you can't have it both ways. Friends of the world are not friends of God, and vice versa. Abraham chose friendship with God by trusting him above all else. But then James says that Abraham's obedience to God's command in Genesis 22 fulfills that verdict or that pronouncement. What does he mean? I think he means that Abraham's obedience to God's command in Genesis 22 fulfills in the sense of bringing to expression his righteous status in his experience. Those whom God counts righteous show their righteousness and ultimately show their faith by obeying God with righteous obedience to God's commands. That's the principle here that James brings over to us. James's explanation in verse 22 makes this clear. Faith, Abraham's faith in God's promises to him, was active, the ESV says. More literally, we could translate it with the New American Standard Bible. Faith was working with his works. Faith and works work together. They cooperate. They must cooperate. Faith and works are on the same team. A single unit working together toward a common goal, as one writer puts it. But James goes further in verse 22. He also says, from the ESV, faith was completed by his works. The NASB says, faith was perfected. The NIV, faith was made complete. This language takes us back to chapter 1, verse 4, where James spoke of how the testing of our faith is to produce endurance, and endurance is supposed to have its complete or perfect outcome that we ourselves may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. That is our destiny. That is the finish line of the Christian life. That's what saving faith looks like and takes us to. Saving faith works together with our works. Our works bring to completion saving faith. It is faith itself that is saving but it accomplishes our salvation, in a manner of speaking, by working with our obedience to God's commands. So what does James say? A mere claim to faith, saying faith, 
claiming to believe in Jesus cannot remain by itself if it is to be saving faith. It must join up with obedience. Faith must work in and through obedience to save sinners from condemnation on Judgment Day. As we'll see in just a moment, this is exactly what Paul taught as well. But James provides a second example. Abraham was the paragon of virtue to Jewish people. He was often viewed as obeying God's law perfectly even before that law was revealed. He was viewed as one who surely earned justification by his works. James says, no, he didn't earn justification by his works. He showed his justification by his works. James next points to Rahab, a pagan, a woman, a prostitute, as a second example to illustrate his point that faith and works work together. Rahab showed her faith, was justified by her work of welcoming the Israelite spies and enabling their escape. Another thing that's interesting about these two is that they are both mentioned in Hebrews 11, the chapter we tend to think of as a hall of faith. But if you read that chapter carefully, it could just as well be viewed as a hall of works. Perhaps we should say that it's a hall of faith and works. Verse 25 says, And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute, justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. Note the phrase, in the same way, in the same way as Abraham. What's different about Rahab's justification is that it is not stated outright in the book of Joshua where her story is told. There's no statement in Joshua that she was counted righteous. But James correctly reads the story from Joshua and recognizes both her faith and her righteousness on display. The famous story is arguably as memorable as Abraham's. A Canaanite citizen of Jericho, or her home, or brothel, was situated in or up against the city wall. The wall that was going to come tumbling down when the Israelite forces of Joshua surrounded the city, blew their trumpets, and shouted. But before that famous victory, Joshua sent two of his men to check out the land of Canaan, and especially to check out the city of Jericho. Perhaps strategically, they stopped in at a house that would have lots of traveling visitors, the house of a prostitute. Did they know that's where they were stopping? Did God providentially guide them to that house? We're not told. Nevertheless, that's where they chose to stay the night. They met Rahab. And they apparently told her who they were and what they were up to. And she hides them from her pursuers, from, from their pursuers, who had been sent out by the ruler of Jericho. When they showed up at Rahab's house asking questions, she lied to protect the Israelites. Then she has a conversation with the spies, and that is where James sees her faith expressed. Joshua chapter 2, verses 9 through 11 records her verbal profession of faith. Listen to what she believes. I know that Yahweh has given you the land, and that the fear of you has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how Yahweh dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For Yahweh your God, He is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Notice that her profession of faith here is not just hers alone. She says that we have heard, and fear has fallen upon us, and all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. But only Rahab and her family would be saved, preserved alive from the coming judgment. While the rest of the citizens of Jericho had heard the message, had heard about Yahweh and what he had been doing for Israel, they merely responded with fear. We might even say that they had a faith that was on par with the demon faith James described earlier. They shuddered in terror because of what they heard. They believed that Yahweh had really done these things for Israel, but their faith did not benefit them. But Rahab believed the same truths, and she benefited from her faith. Why? What's the difference? 
James recognizes that she, like Abraham, completed her faith, brought it to expression by works, by welcoming Joshua's men and ensuring their safe exit from her house. Think about what would have happened if Rahab did nothing. If she simply believed that Yahweh had sent the people of Israel in, given them her land, her territory, the land of Canaan, and she did nothing to help the spies, would she have been rescued, delivered, or in any way incorporated into the people of God? The answer is no. Given James's comparison of Rahab with Abraham, even though the book of Joshua doesn't say it, we are right to conclude that Rahab believed God and it was counted to her as righteousness. She was justified by faith. And then she was justified by works. In the sense that she did a good work of protecting the Israelite men and that work showed her righteousness. And it showed her faith that resulted in that righteousness. James may have even chosen Rahab as an example in part because he saw played out in her life what Jesus described in the parable of Matthew 25 that we looked at earlier. By protecting the spies, she provided for their needs in the same way that Jesus described sheep caring for the needs of other sheep, which would serve as evidence that they were truly his justified disciples had a living faith that had works, and could then inherit the kingdom prepared for them from the foundation of the world. Notice finally the extreme nature of both Abraham's and Rahab's works. Abraham was going to sacrifice the promised son on the altar. Rahab essentially committed treason against her own government. Great risk was involved in both these actions. They were counterintuitive, except that their faith was rightly placed in God. For Abraham, that meant he believed God could raise Isaac from the dead, if necessary, to fulfill the promises that he had made. The author of Hebrews makes that clear. For Rahab, she believed that God was certainly going to give victory to the Israelites. Her land was going to become their land. She believed that, and so she, unlike the rest of the citizens of Jericho, shifted her allegiance to Yahweh, the God of Israel. What does this look like for us? As a church, we are walking through a trial, and we've made hard decisions. We've chosen to keep apart from each other. We've chosen not to gather physically. As leadership, we did not make this choice driven by fear. Our conversations were deliberate, measured, calm, and in no way driven by or characterized by panic. Instead, we are trusting the Lord to care for us. We are trusting the Lord to protect us from harm. But we are also taking seriously our responsibility to cooperate with our government where appropriate and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Our decisions might seem extreme, but I believe taking precautions like this is both wise and a way of working out our faith. Now let's retrace our steps through the passage. We're going to see a dead, useless faith versus living faith in verses 17, 20, and 26. Verse 17, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Verse 20, faith apart from works is useless. Verse 26, for as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Dead faith is useless faith. The word translated useless in verse 20 is an interesting pun. It literally means workless. Faith that doesn't have works doesn't work. It does no good. It benefits no one. It cannot save anyone from God's judgment. He provides an analogy in verse 26 comparing faith without works to a body without a pneuma. That's the Greek word translated spirit. However, the word pneuma, in English we get words like pneumonia, pneumonia, from it. Most often this word is used in the Bible to refer to the Holy Spirit. Next often, this word can be used to refer to the human spirit, as in the immaterial, non-physical aspect of a person. 
But the word can also have two other meanings, depending on the context. Perhaps you remember Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus in John 3, where Jesus compared the work of the Holy Spirit in causing people to be born again to the way that the wind blows. Pneuma is translated as spirit, with a capital S, and also as wind in that passage. Similarly, pneuma is occasionally translated as breath. Outside the Bible, that is one of its more common uses, it, to refer to physical breath or breathing. I think that is what James is referring to here. As the body apart from breath is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. How do you know if a body is living? Can you see it breathing? Put your hand in front of a person's face and mouth. Do you feel breath? coming out of their nose or mouth? Can you see their chest rising? A body without breath is a corpse. So also, how do you know faith is really present in a person's life? Words are not the evidence that can be trusted. Can you see the evidence of works in their lives? A mere verbal profession of faith Someone claiming to believe in Jesus, to know Jesus, to follow Jesus, is not enough, James is saying here. Now as we conclude our time together this, mor this morning, today, whenever you're listening to this or watching this, we need to think about Paul versus James and the big picture. The Reformers recognized the difficulty of fitting Paul's teaching about justification by faith alone with James's teaching about justification that is not by faith alone. But each reformer dealt with the problem a bit differently. Famously, Martin Luther, pressed by his debates with Catholic theologians, came to believe that James should not be considered as authoritative as other scripture. He kept it in his translations of the New Testament, interestingly, but he stuck it at the end and included his assessment of the book as an epistle of straw in an introduction to the book. By an epistle of straw, James was referring to Paul's image from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where the foundation of the church was laid by the apostles preaching the gospel message. Paul taught that others would come and build on that foundation by their preaching and teaching. Some teachers would build with gold, silver, and precious stones, which referred to teaching that fit with and lined up with the priceless and enduring value of the foundation. Others would build with wood, hay, and straw, which referred to teaching that was not appropriate, did not fit with the priceless and enduring value of the gospel foundation. The point of that image for Paul was to warn those who would become teachers in the church that the value of their teaching and preaching would be judged severely, harshly, with fire. And if their teachings didn't fit with the gospel, then they would experience judgment from God. And the fires of judgment would burn up the teaching. Now Paul's not speaking uh, here of heretics who preach a false gospel. For these teachers will indeed survive the judgment, but their labor, their ministry, their teaching will not have any fruit that lasts into eternity. Martin Luther said that the book of James and whoever wrote it would face that judgment. As a side note, it's fascinating to me that this passage in James chapter 2, or at least the way the Catholics were using this passage, is what drove Luther to this conclusion. And the very next passage in James 3.1 begins with a, whor a warning about harsh judgments of those who teach in the church. Well, most other reformers found ways to happily harmonize James' teaching and Paul's teaching. Let me see if I can first illustrate James's primary argument here and then line it up with some things James said earlier in the book. Then we'll take a brief look at comparing James and Paul. James sets up some of his arguments in four-step progressions. The most obvious one is James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, about temptation, 
His argument goes like this. Step one, desire conceives. Step two, desire births sin. Step three, sin grows up. Step four, sin births death. The next one is a bit harder to see. It's James chapter 1, verses 18 to 21, at least to start. James 1, 18 to 21 contains the first two steps. And then step 3 is drawn out over James 1, 22 to 27, and then expanded on in chapter 2, verses 1 to 13, before climaxing step 4 in chapter 2, verse 13. So it's a larger, broader argument that gets built out a lot more. It looks like this. Step 1 in, verse, in chapter 1, verse 18... God births us. Step two, we hear the word with faith. Chapter 1, verse 19 and 21. Now, these two steps happen simultaneously. God births us as we hear the word with faith. Step three, we persevere in doing the word with mercy. This is chapter 1, verse 22, 25, and 27. And then chapter 2, verses 1 through 13 illustrates what it means to endure as doers of the word in terms of not showing favoritism with an accent on extending mercy to the poor and needy. So step three, we persevere in doing the word with mercy. Step four, at the end of verse thir chapter two, verse 13, our mercy overcomes God's judgment. See last week's sermon for elaboration on that point. Now with our passage today, chapter 2, verses 14 to 26, there's still a four-step progression, but he mixes things up a bit. In verse 14, at the beginning of the passage, he provides the first and the last step. And then the rest of the passage fills in the middle. It goes like this. Step one, we claim to have faith. Living faith. We claim to have living faith at the beginning of verse 14. And then step two, we go on to do works. That's verse 18, the second half. We go on to do works. Step three, our works bring our living faith to completion. That's verse 22. And then finally, step four, our living faith saves us from God's judgment. That's at the end of verse 14, at the beginning of the passage. We claim to have living faith. We go on to do works. Our works bring our living faith to completion, and our living faith saves us from God's judgment. James is looking at salvation as what happens when we cross the finish line. He's looking at it as what happens on Judgment Day. And this last point, this last step in this progression is the key. It is our faith that saves us from God's judgment, but it is the faith that is living. Dead faith is no faith. The author of Hebrews used a metaphor similar to this of dead works. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. These dead works are works that need to be repented of and purified by the death of Jesus. Dead works are bad works, sinful works. Dead faith is surely just as bad and just as sinful. A mere profession of faith, simply claiming to believe in Jesus with no works to show the validity of that faith, the livingness of that faith, does not justify and cannot save from God's judgment. Well, what about Paul? Let's acknowledge the genuine difficulty. Paul says in Romans 3.28, For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. James says in James 2.24, You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Taking these two verses in isolation, outside of both of their contexts, certainly does present what appears to be a fundamental contradiction. I've already alluded to the primary way that I reconcile these two. In Romans 3.28, Paul is using the term justify to mean to declare righteous, to receive the verdict of righteous over one's life. While in James 2.24, James is using the term justify to mean to show one's righteousness. Let's consider some broader thoughts from Paul and see just how on the same page Paul and James really are. James says, faith apart from works is dead in James 2.17. And he says, Abraham's faith was completed by his works in James 2.22. Paul similarly speaks of the work of faith in 1 Thessalonians 1.3, by which he surely means work produced by faith. And he speaks of faith 
working through love in Galatians 5, 6. And he speaks of the obedience of faith in Romans 1, 5, by which he surely means the obedience produced by faith. That sounds like the same ideas from both these authors. James says, faith apart from works is useless in James 2, 17. Paul similarly says in 1 Corinthians 13, 2, if I have all faith, but have not love, I am nothing. That sounds like the same idea to me. Finally, to return to James 2.24, James says a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Paul similarly says it is the doers of the law who will be justified in Romans 2.13. So within the span of one chapter between Romans 2 and Romans 3, Paul holds the tension between justification by faith apart from works with those who do the law will be justified. In Romans 2.13, Paul is almost certainly talking about justification on judgment day when we have our day in courts. Paul will go on in Romans 3 and 4 to talk about the verdict being declared, announced, counted the moment we begin to trust in Jesus during our lifetime before we actually have our court dates. On that day, when we have our court day, our justification will be justified. The verdict will be shown to be valid, to fit with the evidence of our lives. God counts us righteous by faith alone. The verdict is in, and it's unchangeable. The basis of that verdict is not our works. The basis of that verdict is the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the perfectly righteous, fully obedient life of our Savior, obeying His Father perfectly, always doing what pleases Him in our place as our representative and substitute. When we trust Jesus, we are trusting Him not only for His death that pays for our sins and failures, but also for His life that earned and demonstrated full and perfect righteousness in a way that we never could. But then, God equips us to actually do good, righteous deeds. And on Judgment Day, those good deeds will become public record to justify God, to vindicate God, that his judgment was good and right when he justified ungodly people like you and me and like Abraham and Rahab. James adds to this picture the idea that our works provide a kind of ongoing justification of our justification during our lifetime. Abraham was justified by works when he offered his son on the altar. Rahab was justified by works when she protected and cared for the Israelite spies. In another sense, Abraham and Rahab were justified by their faith before those events happened. For Abraham, some 25 to 30 years transpired between Genesis 15, 6 and Genesis 22. During those 25 to 30 years, I'm sure Abraham obeyed God in other ways. For sure, he obeyed God by being circumcised in Genesis 17. But James chose to focus on the climactic events of Abraham's life of faith, the offering of the promised son in obedience to God. Their obedience showed their faith. Their obedience showed the validity of the verdict that had already been pronounced over their lives. God had counted them both righteous because of their faith. And then they lived out their faith in obedience to God, showing their faith by their works. So to summarize, Paul is dealing with a controversy of his own. Justification by faith that produces obedience versus justification by works alone. And James is dealing with a different controversy. Justification by works produced by faith versus justification by faith alone, by a claimed faith alone. Paul is setting faith against works alone as a means of justification, whereas James is setting dead faith against living faith, while defining living faith as a faith that has works. 
As the saying goes, talk is cheap. Professions of faith are a dime a dozen. There is such a thing as dead faith, faith that goes no deeper than words. Justification is by faith, not by profession of faith. And as James has already warned us repeatedly, we can be self-deceived. We can deceive ourselves into believing that we're believers when we really have no relationship with Jesus at all. Don't believe the teaching that says obedience is optional for the follower of Jesus, for the Christian. As the Reformers said, we are justified by faith alone, but the faith that justifies is never actually alone. Works don't count toward your righteousness quota. Works don't earn righteousness, justification from God. But works tag along with faith, are produced by faith, come out of faith, a true faith, a living faith. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the gift of faith. You grant faith and its twin brother, the other side of its coin, repentance, as a gift to sinful people who could not trust you, could not believe the truth, could not do a work that pleased you without your work of grace in our hearts and in our lives. We need you to change us. We need you to give us life before we could ever breathe faith. Thank you that that's the way you do it. Thank you that you're not waiting for us to come to you, but you are coming to us. You are drawing us. You are the decisive party in this relationship. You are the one with all the power. And we're so thankful that you use your power for our good. You use your power for our benefit to change us, to grow us, and ultimately to save us, to rescue us from ourselves and the fallenness that we live in in this world. Would you help us, as followers of Jesus, live out our faith? Would you cause, by your Spirit living in us, our faith to bear fruit? We want to bear much fruit. And the key is trusting in Jesus. The key is relying on your grace and the Holy Spirit to work in us what we cannot do on our own. Apart from Jesus, we are and can do nothing. So thank you that you go with us. Thank you that you equip us. Thank you that you give us the gifts that we need to move in obedience to you. Would you help us to move ever more faithfully, to trust you ever more deeply as we go on and we rest, we rest in your grace from here unto eternity. We, can, we confess our need of you. We confess our need of your power and your grace to carry us through not only this trial, but all of our life to ensure that we make it to the finish line and that we stand in our day in court unashamed and with our hope placed fully in Jesus and in Jesus alone. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.